Okay, we are recording, so you can go ahead and start. Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order at 6.20 p.m. Uh, roll call. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my notes here. Abayana? Here. Gutierrez Pilari? Absent. Papua? Here. Owens? Here. And myself, Rudolph. Uh, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America, of America. To and to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible justice for liberty, liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. <laughs> Okay, approval of agenda. I need a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Public comment. Uh, Dr. Pittman, are there any public comments? There are no public comments this evening. Okay. Uh, consent item number five. Uh, Need a motion and a second to approve the consent items. I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item six, educational services. I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Pittman. So I am going to share my screen. And... Um, share some updates regarding the local control accountability plan that we have to report out for this year and as we think about planning for the 21 to 24 year. Okay, uh, thumbs up if you can see my screen. Yeah. Great. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about the updates. As we know, um, in the past, we had a three-year rolling LCAP. Our previous LCAP technically ended um, at the end of the school year in 2020. Last spring, we were supposed to be working on a new LCAP um, for 2020 through 2023. And then as we know, the pandemic hit. And so the state put a pause on the LCAP and they had us write the learning continuity and attendance plan. And so some of those changes, because we did not write an, a three-year LCAP and we implemented the learning continuity and attendance plan are gonna be reflected in the LCAP that we now have to write that will be from 2021 through 2024. So we still have to give an annual update. Um, we have to share what work we accomplished from the final year in 1920 um, up through knowing that we went into shelter at home in March. We also have to give an annual update regarding the work that we've done this year according to our learning continuity and attendance plan. We have to do an overall analysis which talks about the strengths that occurred as well as the, situ the areas that we were struggling in um, and talk about what is it that we can learn from that that will then take us into the next three year plan. And then we need to write new goals and actions that will carry us through 2024. So the annual update for 1920, the reason is we want to have a process of understanding actually what happened prior to shelter in place. We know we were doing good work. We know we had actions and services in place. What of those were we able to accomplish prior to going into shelter in place? Were any of those able to be carried over? Um, do we want to continue with any of those? We want to make sure that there's a process of reviewing, reflecting, and being transparent with our stakeholders. And the annual update allows us to do that. And we can communicate that with our stakeholders. And then obviously it allows us a process for determining what we want to continue al to align and what doesn't with our current realities and data. Obviously we're in a very different place. So some things that we might've put into place prior to COVID-19 may no longer be relevant. Um, and we might want to say, we want to put those to a side and come, and come up with some other actions and services. Um, it has a similar annual update template. Um, we tell us who we are. That's what LEA, LEA information means. We identify the goals and the state and local priorities that we were addressing. 
um, and then we have to address the annual measurable outcomes. Obviously taking into account that most schools, including ours, used state testing data as one of the measurable outcomes. We did not take state tests last year. So then that means that's not gonna be that's not going to be counted into the report that we get. You froze for a, Am I back for on? a minute. Yeah, Am I back you're back on, on now. Yeah. Okay, where so did I, I didn't. Uh, in a way. Um, not sure, but carry on. You want me to do the whole slide? No. No, we can see it. Okay. It's okay. Doc. Okay. Um, next is we have to, for the actions and services, we aren't going to report on the actual a, um, actions and services because we were only in school for a partial year. Um, for the goal analysis, they eliminated the narratives and reduced them to two. Um, and the narrative gives us an opportunity to incorporate what actually happened during the pandemic and how we pivoted to shelter in place. So some of the things that we reported in the learning continuity and, and attendance plan that we talked about what happened in March when we went into shelter in place, we will be able to communicate that when we give the annual update. We then have to have a section on what did we actually do during the 2021 school year. So it, that section is organized by what we reported in the learning continuity and attendance plan. So in terms of continuity of learning, we gave information uh, regarding in-person instructional offerings. We gave information regarding our distance learning progr program. And then we talked about how we were gonna address pupil learning loss. So we'll have to report on each one of those three components. We will also have to report on the additional actions that we discussed, which include mental health and social and emotional well-being, how we uh, involved our pupil and family engagement and how we reached out to them, and then how we address school nutrition. So we'll do two things. One is we'll reflect on what we said we were gonna do and then talk about what we did and if where the strengths were and where there were areas that we needed to improve. For the continu continuity of learning sections, again, it's in-person distance and then pupil learning loss. We actually have to report what our actual expenditures were for each of the actions that we said. Um, we have to give a description if there were any subsidence differences. So for example, if we said that for the distance learning program, we needed to buy a hundred Chromebooks to give to our students and that was gonna cost us um, $300,000 and we actually only bought 50, that's a substantial, that's a substantive difference to go from saying we're gonna spend 300,000 and we only spent 150. Or if we said we were gonna spend 150 and it turned out we needed to buy 300, we would need to report on why there's a major difference. If we said we were gonna spend $5,000 and we spent 4,371, that's not considered a substantive difference, we're in the ballpark. And then there'll be an analysis, a description of successes and challenges based on each one of those components. Within the distance learning program, um, there are specific areas that we need to report on if applicable. So we need to talk about continuity, conti continuity of instruction, which obviously is applicable to us because we went from in-person to shelter in place, and then we transfer transitioned even more so when we opened up in the school year. We will need to address access to devices and connectivity because we gave out devices and we gave out um, um, hotspots. We'll need to report on pupil participation and progress during distance learning, report on professional development that staff um, received. And then if there were any staff role and responsibilities that changed specifically for pupils with unique needs. And so their description of what a pupil is with a unique need is if they are one of our unduplicated students, which includes our English learners, any students that are in foster care, any students that are experiencing homelessness or any students that qualify for the national school lunch program. It also includes any of our students with IEPs. So those are the students with exceptional needs served across the full spectrum of, of placements. Regarding pupil learning loss um, and the additional actions, again, uh, mental health and social emotional well-being, pupil and family engagement and outreach, and school nutrition. So for all three of those components, just like for the 1920 LCAP, we need to do an analysis, a description of our successes and challenges. We need to do estimated actual expenditures for each action, and then we give a description of any substantive differences. The reason that this 
2021 says estimated versus the 1920 says actual is because 1920 is done and closed. We know exactly how much we spent. And this year has to be completed. This report needs to be completed before the end of the 2021 school year. And so there still might be some out, outstanding costs that we need to estimate. So that's why it's considered estimated actuals. And then there's two overall analysis. Again, we have to give an overall analysis of the 2021 learning continuity and attendance plan. We also need to give an overall analysis of the 1920 LCAP implementation. And then utilizing those two, we will use that information to talk about how did that have an impact on designing our goals, actions, and services for 21 through 24. So we have to include how in-person and distance learning programs inform our 21 to 24 LCAP. We have to think about how pupil learning loss continues to be assessed and addressed as we come back to 21 through 24. And again, we have to report on any substantive differences for increased and improved services. So any questions on the annual update? I know it's a lot of information. Now the LCAP is, is based on the regular school year schedule. So it would not include summer sessions if there were. We have to have this approved we have to write this, it could have approved, it could include summer, but it would be the last summer because we take it um, to the board for public hearing in May and it has to be approved in June, which is before we go into summer. But in our goals, so that's a great um, segue as we think about when we talk about how are we gonna address pupil learning loss in 21 through 24, we can include in our goals and actions and services that we're planning to have a substantive, substantive summer program. And that would be included in the actual LCAP for 21 to 24. And then if we say that that's one of our goals, actions and services, then next year when we do the annual update, that's when we would report on how did the summer school go. Okay. So it's on a, we report at the end of every school year. So any summer happenings that occur, we report on the results of those at the end of the next school year. So then just as just a reminder, again, we have to write goals, actions, and services. Um, so in, in order to come up with those actions and services, um, we take into consideration our previous LCAP. We take into consideration the learning continuity and attendance plan from this year. We take into consideration how we analyzed the, the work that we did over the last LCAP as well as this school year. We have to make sure that we address the state and local metrics and we gather stakeholder input. And so stakeholder input includes our kids, our families, our staff, you, um, community members um, that may be in the community that uh, have input about our schools. So we want a broader input into versus just one small group of input. And we wanna make sure that our goals and actions address learning loss, identify existing and new gaps, and then come up with ideas and plans on how we're gonna over, overcome these gaps. And that, what, that is what informs the development of the LCAP for next year, as well as thinking about two more years out. So at a minimum, the LCAP has to address all eight of the LCFF priorities and associated metrics, we, and those have not changed. Those are the same that we've been doing for the past um, several years. Obviously, we should consider performance on the state and local indicators. Um, as well as the dashboard, which comes out every fall. Um, and then in order to support prioritization of goals, the template provides LEAs with the option of developing three different types of goals. And this is similar to last year. This didn't change as well. We knew this was, this was what was gonna end up happening. So um, well, I'm gonna start in the middle and work my way out. And so one type of goal is a broad goal, which are the current goals that we had from last year. Um, so a broad goal is relatively less con concentrated in scope and may focus on improving performance across, across a wide range of metrics. So for example, our school connectedness goal, asking that our students be connected and our families and staff be connected to school is a broad goal. We could have a focus goal and you can have any combination of these. You can have all of one type. Um, well, you can't have all of one maintenance of progress, but you could have a mix or you could have all, of, all broad or all focus. Um, a focus goal is relatively more concentrated in scope and may focus on a fewer number of metrics, 
The focus goal statement will be time bound and make clear how the goal is to be measured. So a focus goal could specifically be our number of students who are reading at grade level by third grade. So if we were to write a SMART goal specifically addressing students reading at grade level by grade three, that would be a focus goal. And then the maintenance of progress, for example, is our facilities. We don't have any um, up, updates that we need to make. We don't need new windows. We don't need things like that. And so we want to maintain the progress that our facilities are in. And so that would be a maintenance of progress. The ideal situation is you want a blend of, of these three types of goals. And the reason being is because you don't want to have all broad goals where we don't really come center and say, this is how we plan on addressing one specific issue that we might have. And we don't want all focus goals because we want to make sure that we also look at the big picture. So it's that fine dance between the forest and the trees. You want to see the trees, but you also want to see the forest. So any questions on that? Uh, with uh, regard to the OCAP, uh, will you have any uh, advisory meetings with parents I will. Um, as you have in the past? I okay. will. So we will have advisory meetings with um, for our EL, our parent group. Um, we will also be sending out, we're working on a survey. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about that I've mentioned is I try to find silver linings in certain situations that have happened. And one of the silver linings of us being in distance learning throughout this year is we get um, a, a extremely high return rate on surveys when we send them out to our families. And so I predict that we're going to get much more input on this LCAP than we've had in the past. And so we're working Imagine on a that. survey that's going to go out. Um, that's gonna ask questions about what is what do our families want? What do our kids want for the future? And as we think about what the next three are and thinking about uh, graduation outcomes, thinking about what are we wanna be able to offer for our kids? Um, and, and we're gonna do the same with the staff, obviously survey you as a board. Um, so there will be much more input. Um, I do anticipate, unfortunately, that most of this will be virtual input um, between now and when the LCAP is adopted, I don't anticipate us being able to have in-person meetings yet. Um, but when we get to that point, that will be an option. Great, thank you. Now, um, just a, uh, a tangent to something further down the agenda. Is there a way to that we should be trying to actively link our board goals to the LCAP goals? Yes actually we'll link the LCAP goals to the to the board goals. Good, so, right first, so thank you. So when, so when we go over the board goals, I will show you how our last LCAP goals fit into those categories. Great. Um, and so you'll see that whatever we choose for our LCAP goals, they will, they will fall into one of those four categories if those are the four categories that you as a board decide to choose. So that was my report for the LCAP. Okay, so uh, um, item seven, human resources, there are no items for this meeting. Uh, item eight, business and fiscal services, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Pittman. So for developer fees, this uh, for the month of January, we received $48,889.01 for the homes being built in phase seven of the Toll Brothers project. One cent. <laughs> Man, can they just round it up? We got to We split it. <laughs> we had to split it with Jefferson Union. They got the other ninety-nine cents. <laughs> <laughs> so they're closing in on their last phase. Um, Actually, no, they have ten. Phases. We... So they have three more phases. So they're closing in on the last three. Yes. And did they determine um, as far as the uh, timeline or? Their hope is to be completed by the end of this year. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's great. When I, when I looked on their website, there were still about a half dozen lots marked as available. Okay. So I'm on their email distribution, their marketing campaign. So it's... <laughs> did, did they give you a discount, Mr. Rudolph? Start no, it's starting at one point five. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If there's no other questions for Dr. Pittman on the developer fees, um, 
we'll move to item nine, school reports. And I'll pass it back over to Dr. Pittman. So I am going to, we have some special guests that should be sitting in the audience and I am going to transition them to be panelists um, because our first item under school reports is our monthly highlight. Uh, per the request of the board, every month we're gonna do a monthly highlight, um, which could be a program, in this case, Bayshore TV. It could be a grade level, um, but each month we will highlight um, staff and students who are doing wonderful things on our campus, which is not gonna be difficult to find. What's difficult to find is if they wanna come and be on camera. Um, and so I'm excited. So we're gonna start with those that are on camera anyway with Bayshore TV. So I am gonna make Mr. Dyson um, a panelist as well as our four uh, Bayshore TV students who have made our first video, which I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna do that first. I'm gonna show the video and then I'm gonna bring them on board. So I am really excited about this. They shared it with me. Um, I couldn't stop smiling when I saw it. I said, when are you gonna make it public? Cause I wanna communicate it out um, with everybody that I know, all of my colleagues and um, my, all of my fellow superintendents, the state, uh, the, the county superintendent was so impressed with it. She asked me to share it with the entire 23 superintendents in San Mateo County. And she actually was going to share it with uh, Dr. Scott Morrow, the health officer for the San Mateo County, as well as one other health officer. So they did exceptional work. I'm extremely proud. Yeah. And all of the Can you guys hear? Yes. Yeah. Hey there, it's Gigi. Many people have been asking about coming back to school again. With our world being turned upside down by the coronavirus, coming back to school has been one thing many of us want, but don't know if it will be possible. The Bayshore School has been working very hard to make sure for us to return, all staff, students, and families will need to do their part to make sure we help slow the spread of this virus by following the guidelines of the four pillars of the pandemic framework. The first one is health, health, health and hygiene. Health and hygiene, what does that even mean? Health and hygiene, don't worry, I got this Gigi. Health and hygiene has to do with keeping areas clean, keeping our hands clean, and temperature checks, also essential protective equipment, or EPE. I know, that was a lot, so let me break it down for you. The common areas and restrooms will be cleaned and disinfected frequently, multiple times a day, before, after, and in between student groups. Staff will clean and disinfect frequently kept surfaces in common areas and restrooms and in classrooms. Those of us who will be on campus are asked to use hand sanitizer when entering, and staff and students have access to sinks in classrooms and restrooms to wash our hands. Every person coming on campus will have their temperature checked to assure that no one has a temperature above 100 degrees. And don't worry, there will be plenty of face covering, disinfecting wipes, gloves, and cleaning supplies, and other protective equipment needed for the protection of everyone. And if you are sick at any time, please stay home and take care of yourself before returning to school. Okay, Gigi, you got that? Yeah, thanks, Sam. That makes so much sense now. Health and hygiene is super important. Gigi, you don't have to wear a mask right now. We're not even in the same place. 
Oh, yeah, that's right. But hey, while we're at it, we might as well talk about the second pillar, face mask. Where's Emily when I need her? <laughs> Wait, hold up. Did I miss it? Oh, no, I'm so sorry. No, no, no. You just made it. You're just in time. Oh, good. Wait, what are we talking about again? Face mask. All right, face mask. Face masks help to prevent the chance of the spread of COVID-19. We wear our face masks not just for us, but for the safety of others, too. All staff, students from kindergarten through eighth grade, and even campus visitors. Please be sure to wear those cool face masks when you come to school. They should always be worn while walking across school grounds and in common areas of the campus. And just in case you forgot your face mask, the Bayshore School will provide one for you when you come. Wear a mask, save a life. You know, I have been seeing some really nice face masks that people have been wearing. From Spongebob to Spider-Man. From cool colors to very nice designs. Maybe we should have something like a face mask contest or something. Hmm. That's a great idea, Emily. You think I could win? Maybe. Aw, uh, you're so kind, Emily. Give me a hug. Stop. What are you doing? Calm down, Chloe. It's just a hug. I know. I want hugs, too, but we can't do that with our friends right now. It's called physical distancing. Oh, yeah. That's the third pillar. Right. According to CDC, physical distancing is one of the most effective tools to avoid exposure to the COVID-19 virus and slow the spread. That means maintaining at least six feet or two arms length away from other people. Avoid gathering in groups and stay out of crowded places. So Bayshore has taken some extra steps to make sure we do well at this. Some of you may have noticed that there are markers throughout the hallways that to them and follow the directions <laughs> can help everyone remain at least six feet apart. There are multiple entrances to the school. There's the main entrance, the entrance to the multi-purpose room, and the square and gate entrance. The traffic will flow in one direction when entering and exiting the campus. Lastly, all classrooms will be set up so that students sit a minimum of six feet away from each other. Tables will have plastic screen guards dividing the tables for extra precaution. Wow! Thanks, Chloe. That helps a lot. No problem. Feel free to do a virtual high five or an air hug. Ah, uh, you could, keep. <laughs> well, that's three pillars, but there are four. The fourth one is... The fourth one is... Hey, Gigi! You coming to my party? There's gonna be so many people there. Oh, gosh! I forgot! I'm on my way! Is this a trick? <laughs> yes! And you almost fell for it. Oh, Charity! The fourth pillar is Lemonade Gathering. Exactly, like Chloe mentioned, once the school reopens, we will use multiple entrance and exit. Anyone coming on campus for school business, you will use the main entrance. Once we are in the hybrid model, multiple entrances will be used for entrance and exit. The main entrance will be used for pre-K and staff only. The multi-purpose room entrance will be used for students with the last name A to L. The Sherwin Gate entrance will be used for students with the last name M to Z. Parents are asked not to come on campus unless they are conducting school business and must check in through the main office. To exit the campus, all students walking will exit the campus through the Sherwin Gate exit. Parents picking up Students will line up at the Sherwin gate. Students being picked up by vehicle will exit through the garden exit. Parents picking up students will drive through the drop-off pickup lane in the parking lot. All students that are transitioning to BGC will wait in the multi-purpose room. All non-extensional activities like morning circles, student of the month, back to school night, and other events like those will, will continue to be held virtually. 
graduation, virtually, school concerts, virtually, movie night, virtually, my birthday. Uh, that'll be so much fun, but I'm pretty sure it would it would be virtually. Oh man, don't worry, I'll be there virtually. Good, thanks, Charlie. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Please remember to wash your hands well or use hand sanitizer. Wear your mask when necessary. Be sure to keep six feet of physical distance from others, not in your household. And limit gathering in crowds. We will be back to school as soon as it is safe. To do so, this is Gigi reminding you to stay, stay safe and be well. Bye. So, what a great hey. Yes, a round of applause. <laughs> so now I'm going to bring Mr. Dyson. Um, so you have to give me a second to um, find each one, and I'm going to make them a panelist so that you can see them and they can talk um, and you can ask questions or make statements. So there's Mr. Dyson. I am also going to bring on one of our students, Samantha Abiana. Next is Emily Zhao. Next is Chloe Colantis. Charity Lim. And Giselle Chavez. She just has the Giselle, so I'm gonna assume that is her. So if Charity and Giselle, excellent. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Dyson. Oh, okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. So um, it was a great pleasure um, working on this project. It started out as just an idea, um, looking at the um, returning, safe return um, document that Dr. Pittman shared with the whole staff. And I just took a look at it and I thought, you know, thought of a way to kind of break down the four pillars so they can be easy to explain. Um, we made a little short script and I just gave it to the girls and they went for it. And I thought they did a great, great job. So I want to congratulate Chloe, Charity, Giselle, Sam, and Emily for doing such a great job on it. Great job, team. Yes, amazing. You yeah, did awesome. And thank you, Mr. Dyson and all the staff that were involved in um, making this video. Um, Ms. Baker, you did a great job in assisting with the whole process. And uh, I think this is, um, this is an opportunity to put it out there and then uh, all the other districts can follow through and make sure that uh, this, is, this is the standard of how we need to keep our school safe and our community safe. Agreed. You, Mr. Dyson, and the team has displayed excellent 
attention and I gotta, to technical. I, I gotta say also that these girls wake up every day. Let me add this. They wake up every day at eight o'clock in the morning, every day to get on um, record with us, myself and oh, Miss so Baker and Coach Kevin. Kevin to do Bayshore Family Circle every single morning. So just hats off to them for doing that. We added another student, um, Aliyah Lugo, who's doing an incredible job also. So Bayshore TV is growing and it's going somewhere. So thank you. I was Good. wondering, maybe we can share this with the city. Yeah. I think that is a fantastic idea. And tomorrow I will call no? Daily City. Hey. I, will, I will send it over to them. And I think I might actually right. send it over to District 5 San Mateo County Supervisor, David Canepa, who also happens to be Supervisor President. I think it would be great for them. To right. I mean, you, you ladies, ladies be and famous. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dyson display thorough understanding of technology and excel. This is a good practice for you ladies, young ladies. Yeah. Chloe, oh my gosh, Chloe, in preschool, you were so shy to even talk to anybody. And look at you. So and, and let me also thank say you this, ladies. that Emily originally thank didn't want to, when Emily first came to our team, she didn't want to talk at all. She didn't want to be on screen at all. So I'm just really proud of them and, and their growth and how they're just moving ahead. And they're actually creating their own shows. So you're going to see more from them coming soon. That's great. I, I, I see that's evolving into other areas. So I'm very, I'm very happy to, to see that success. So let's Thank give you. one more round of applause for our Bayshore TV crew. Hey. Thank you, ladies. Very good. Thank everyone, you. Everyone, please subscribe and tell, tell everyone in the community uh, to subscribe to our Bayshore TV. Yes, absolutely. Great plug. <laughs> okay, uh, Bayshore TV crew, I'm going to take you off from being panelists so nobody has to see you anymore and you can turn your screen off if you would like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For Thank you, Mr. Time. Dyson. Thank, Thank you. you, all the kids. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. It was so neat to see the video. I, I, I must be honest to tell you that it was it was nice to see that. Yes, I was like I said when they first released it, and he was like, "You got to keep it private." Um, I was just smiling from ear to ear, and I said, "When can you make it public?" And I was not joking when I said I immediately texted um, and forwarded it over to uh, a small group of superintendent colleagues. And they were so excited and so impressed, forwarded over to Superintendent Nancy McGee of the county office. Um, and she was like, you need to share this and I'm gonna communicate this with the San Mateo County Health Office. Your kids did a beautiful job. Um, so I am really proud of the work that the I'm girls just... did. Um, and obviously the work that Mr. Dyson did in terms of pulling this, I mean, his, his talent is, is amazing. So very, yeah. very lucky to have him, so. I wonder if we can um, somehow even have any connections with the channel news, you know? Uh, I, don't um, know. I, can, I can look into that to see if we can reach out to them. maybe send it to them like a commercial, well, like something that, like a... I know there's a local channel that you guys, like what's the channel that you can watch the day? I know Mr. Owens has, it's 26, I think. Channel 26, I'm going to look yeah. at it. I, if I'm correct to Mr. Owens. Pardon me? Yeah, 26. Okay, right. <clears throat> I will call the city city hall to find out what the connection is um, and see how we can possibly get this out to our community. So thank Great. you. Great. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Principal Baker um, to speak about um, the rest of the school reports. Oh, of course. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, Artie's barking. Um, so yeah, and just in addition to the work that um, Mr. Dyson has done with us in Bayshore TV, um, we're extending this to a lot of other things. This is something when we think about the, the lemonade we're gonna make out of the lemons that we've gotten from COVID. Um, you know, this is one of the most beautiful things that I feel is gonna emerge 
from this la this year and the year before is um, Bayshore TV is, is growing, like Mr. Dyson said, um, and this is not something that's gonna go away once we are in some semblance of normalcy. This is something that has come from this that we're gonna keep carrying with us. And one of the ways that we've carried that with us is through um, Black History Month. So the um, Dismantling White Supremacist Culture team, DWSC, has been um, meeting and spearheaded Black History Month led by uh, Nishat Taylor, one of our kindergarten teachers. And um, they put together a calendar which is shared every morning on Bayshore Family Circle where it is uh, daily led recordings by teachers celebrating self-expression and the overcoming of adversity by Black Americans, poets, musicians, writers, and actors ending with a quiz on Fridays. And Ms. Heinrich has been doing the quizzes and they're pretty fantastic. They're, she's, she's very, very good. I think she could have a side hustle as a um, game show host. And she said it's because she's doing so many games with her class that is just coming really naturally to her, but it's pretty fantastic. Um, We've been talking about the fact that there are other more dominant cultures at Bayshore that are not celebrated and should be um, at this juncture, due to the amount of violence against black people in our country and the bias that impacts them on a daily basis, as well as the historical trauma unique to the black experience in our country, it takes priority at this moment to be a part of this. Um, specific to Bayshore, when Circle of Education did some work where they did something called affinity groups, where they talked to children in different cultural groups, um, our black students expressed multiple ways they felt that they were treated unfairly. And so um, while yes, of course, we really want to celebrate all of the diversity and culture at Bayshore, this is a time in, um, in, our, in, our, in America where I think it's really important to um, really celebrate and elevate this uh, Black Lives Matter. So um, that said, this is this Black History Month work is going to segue into a Bayshore Culture Committee, which will begin the conversation about Latinx, Filipino, Chinese, and Pacific Islander History Months, and um, not just those little compartmentalized months, but just ways that we can celebrate the, um, the beautiful diversity that is our school community. And um, so I'm excited about what the Bayshore culture community can start to um, become as it grows. Um, I would like to, we're gonna start investigating, working more closely with Pitt, with Pacific Islanders together. Um, you know, I think that is a resource sort of thinking about us going beyond our school walls and our community. That is a, a resource and, um, and just a, a gift that needs to be shared amongst all of us, not just at a Christmas giveaway. So I'm looking forward to making connections with other cultural groups and, um, and elders in our community as we grow the bond between our school and our community. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that little Black History Month report. And then Kinder, um, I wanted to report out about our Kinders on campus. So we have a little cohort of kindergartners who have high needs both academically and economically. These are kids who have been really hit, hard hit by what is going on with COVID. They have single parents. Some of them are living in shelters or in unsafe home environments. And so this is providing an opportunity for them to um, be in a safe place where they can really get the hands-on learning that they need. And I'm gonna highlight Mrs. Taylor again. She really pushed hard to make this happen as she recognized um, both the inequity and, and the need that was happening. Um, it happened because BGC was not, it just was really difficult to, to, for them to support the hands-on learning that the kinders needed during distance learning. So there's a morning cohort that's for kids that are struggling with a lot of logging in and not attending school. Um, they are required to attend every single day. If they are missing days, there is that spot will be given to someone else and the families have taken that very seriously. There's also an afternoon cohort that's focusing on phonics and language development and catering to our kids with um, English language development needs. 
who are not showing progress with letter recognition and sounds. And what they really needed, they are getting, they're grateful, they're happy. Um, one of the kids was at school last week and, I, and she, was, she didn't look very happy. And I asked her why she didn't look happy. And she said, I want more school. <laughs> it's like, yes, we all want more school, but you get to be here and that's pretty special. So, um, so that's really great. The setup is very similar to, I'd say it's it's similar to what the pre-K is in some ways, but it's it's not um, it's it's set up differently in that there's like the kids they there are the sneeze guards each kid has their own table um, following all of the four pillars just like in the video just like the kids all taught us and um, and so that's what's happening with Kinder after the break we are going to bring in a first grade cohort that is going to function very similarly. And we're excited to make that happen because these are first graders who had a lot of learning loss in kindergarten at the end of last year due to COVID. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to report out was just something that the mental health team and I were realizing is that um, the kids, you know, they really need, they're trying to figure out how we can be creative and safe and have them connect with one another. And it started with ideas about virtual Minecraft, virtual Fortnite, like let's have a Zoom meeting where we can do arts and crafts. And it just, what they really need is just to have space and time to connect and talk to each other, not on a screen. <laughs> and so the way we figured to do that safely was to have um, lunch bunch on Taco Tuesday and Pizza Friday. So Mr. Brian and I and Coach Kevin are there every Tuesday and Friday from 11.15 to 12.15, it's packed. Well, I'm sorry, at 10 students. And um, last week it was a little slow running. We had a nice time having lunch, but there were no kids. And then today was wonderful. They were just seeing the kids come with some big smiles on their faces and just sit one kid at a table in the lunch area. I mean, there were only three kids, but it was really, really wonderful to have that time with them, just to not have any agenda and just to connect and say hi and have music playing on the stage like we used to during lunchtime. Um, and that has been really special. And I'm hopeful that other needs will emerge and surface as we get that time to just chit chat with the kids at lunch. So that's Taco Tuesday and Pizza Friday. If you wanna join us from 11.15 to 12.15, it's an enormous space and um, we'd welcome having lunch with you with our fabulous lunches as we all know. So I thanks. was about to ask. <laughs> so 11.15? 11.15 to 12.15, yep. Okay. You are more than welcome to bring your own lunch or you can buy a school lunch. <laughs> Why would I bring my own lunch if it's Taco Tuesday? Yeah. I'm just saying. Not yeah. to buy a school lunch from the Bayshore School Lunch Program. They yeah. don't get any better than our school lunches. I must admit, the school lunches at Bayshore now are are superb. I mean, it's, it's better than your fast food restaurants or, or any other sandwich place out there, but Bayshore has the right food. I mean, I, I'm really happy to see the success of, of all the foods that come through that kitchen. It's amazing. And the different cultures that are shared uh, through that. So it's great. Well, please join us. We look forward to, to seeing you. My report. Thank you, Mrs. Baker. I have one question. With regards to family engagement, how are we doing with PTO or, or how are we reaching out to families? Um, we're reaching out to families mostly through surveys right now. Um, as you know, uh, Lisa and Arnold are resurrecting our PTO and um, they called elections recently. So I'm gonna meet with their, their new executive board I believe tomorrow after school, everybody can make it. And, um, and so we'll start that conversation about what their agenda is, what they wanna focus on. Um, so, but I would say that the surveys have just been really successful. We have more connection with families online than ever. And it's just been a really easy way to get a, a pulse of what, where people are at for sure. And that's great to hear. Yeah, that we're getting it seems like are we getting responses to these surveys? Yeah, I mean we have yeah, they're few and I don't want to bomb we don't want to bombard them with anything. Sure. You know, we're trying to be really thoughtful 
um, about what we're what we're working on with them. We're putting together right now a survey about a graduate profile survey to kind of gauge what they want. And just, you know, we did it with the teachers and now we're gonna do it with our kids and with our families to um, just start to hone in on where what direction we're going now that we've kind of dusted ourselves off after COVID. Stuff. Right. <laughs> good, that's good news. Great to hear. Yeah, and maybe- uh, I, um, I was- Sorry, go ahead. Oh. Lisa. I was wondering, since we have this fabulous Bayshore TV and we're at celebrating um, this month, I was wondering if also we need to highlight a, a family or highlight a parent, you know, um, see if we can reach out to a parent that even wants to share something like to read a book on the Bayshore TV, you know, um, about the culture. I was asked by the city to read a sub one book to to our to the city of Daly City, but um, that's in the process. They got the book and everything, but you know those little things that you know I to add to uh, Mr. Rick. That's another family engagement using what we have, and then you know able to reach out to the family. Hey, we'd like to highlight you, and would you like you know not to bombard them, but you know that you're a perf you're the mother of the year or the parents of the month. I think that's a really good idea. We've been um, pushing out to the kids to send us videos of themselves. Like we have Talent Tuesday and Family Circle, and that we've got a lot of we have a lot of talent at Bayshore. So you know that's been really fun, but it's not nearly what we know is out there. And I think that's a really good idea to. Uh, to, to push it to the parents and not just the kids. You know, we're kind of relying on them. They, they did a great, you know, in the spring, there was, a, you know, one of the kids in middle school had a cooking show. You know, there were things that, um, that we just, we need to, to keep encouraging. And I like that idea of incorporating our families into it as well. That's a great idea, Teresa. Even like a clip of them doing the cooking, you know, like, you know, cooking project or, you know, sewing or anything or dancing together. I feel that would be a, another good idea. So yeah, maybe a spotlight segment on Bayshore TV. Um, we have Talent Tuesday and then we have Family Friday. Um, and so I think that's, I think Family Friday would be like every Friday we could highlight a, a, one of our families, something. And we have had some dancing and we've had some singing and we've had um, a little bit of, I would call it food assembly. I don't know if I would call it cooking. <laughs> we can, but I think, you know, we just have to keep pushing. And I, you know, we're definitely learning that you just keep, keep messaging it out there and keep finding multiple ways to push it out. And, um, and then there is, it's always received well. I mean, you know, Bayshore TV is the bomb. Like we really have it going on. We're really doing it. It's, it's great. And I'm glad that you, um, I mean, I couldn't, I've seen it so many times and I still can't stop smiling when I watch that video. <laughs> I'll be honest, I haven't missed an episode. Uh, it's something I look forward to, uh, to get my information in, in the Bayshore School and the community and uh, to, to see what's going on. And you guys have evolved uh, to, a, to a degree where you're sharing a lot of information daily and it's, uh, it's great. On that note, Rick, I just hit the subscribe button if there anyone you go. hasn't done it yet, go to the YouTube, type in Bayshore TV and hit subscribe. There you go. <laughs> There's also a link on our website and on the Bayshore app. How many subscribers do we have so far? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I suppose we could check with Mr. Dyson and see if, because, yeah, because he runs it. So I don't think I can see. I, I know that there are 103 people who saw the video. Um, there's 166 subscribers. Is that what it says? Yeah, that's what it says. And it's growing. So we may want to talk offline in terms of um, the Bayshore TV team of how can we bump up that, that number to see how many subscribers we can get. We would hope that we would have at least the number of families plus staff members plus board members. That should be our minimum and then, and then go from there. There you go. 
Or we can send out an incentive, like the number 300 subscriber will we'll win something. You know, there you go. Will be something. A, you know, you got to be creative in those things. Like number 300 or 400, your face will be on the face or um, marquee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I like it. <laughs> I'm going to remove you from being a panelist. Thank you, Baker. Yes, thank, thank you, Ms. Baker. Ms. Baker. Hey, everyone. Hmm, I can't because I made you the alternative host. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm going to share my screen now. <laughs> okay. I'll need my video to make it. Okay, so item 10 are my reports. And so uh, I'm gonna go over our board goals, which we went over on our Saturday board study session. Um, the governance handbook, a, a draft board calendar as we think about what the year looks like. Um, I'm gonna briefly talk about the Access Superintendent Symposium, which I attended virtually two weeks ago. Give a COVID-19 update. I'm gonna talk about our Bayshore Community Farmers Market um, Garden Project, and Mrs. Baker can um, jump in on that as well. And then um, give an update, uh, Census 2020 update, and then upcoming dates. So in terms of the board goals, these goals are our overarching goals from the board's perspective. Um, and then to the conversation that we had earlier in the meeting, our LCAP goals will fall into one of these, one of these four goals. Um, we're going to start creating action plans within these four goals um, that we as a board and a governance team will hold each other accountable to and, um, and work through in terms of helping us move forward. Um, we will be surveying our stakeholders and this will guide our LCAP goals. So back to your, your question earlier, Mr. Rudolph, that they will all um, be intertwined together. So in January, we reviewed the goals in a board study session. Um, we're now in February, we're gonna review the goals again um, and have some open dialogue. And then in March, we'll actually, at our March board meeting, we'll actually adopt them. During the month of March, we'll be surveying our stakeholders um, in relationship to the LCAP, in relationship to these goals, in relationship to uh, Mrs. Baker's point about graduation outcomes. What do, what do they want for their children? Um, in April, we'll do a first reading of our board action plans as well as our draft LCAP. Um, in May, we will adopt our board action plans as well as hold the public hearing of our LCAP. And in June, we adopt the LCAP. And so we're, we're doing this all simultaneously because they are all intertwined. So the four goals that we had last year um, and then we redrafted on at our went over on our Saturday board meeting include number one, equity and access through high quality teaching and learning. So when we think about the examples that I gave of a focus goal, a broad goal and a maintenance goal for the LCAP, these four goals, because they are board goals, they are very broad goals. They are big picture, visionary, thinking about what do we want for Bayshore. And as a governance team and as the board, where do you want to focus? Where do you want us as a school to focus our time and energy? And so you've, you've, we've had this conversation over the past two years and the four categories are equity and access through high quality teaching and learning, wellness and safety, communication and connection and financial stability. So um, for equity and access, um, we said that we want to assure every student has access to equity driven and culturally relevant instruction, multiple activities and enrichment experiences that appropriately challenges all students to ensure core content mastery and maximizes each student's opportunity to be engaged, educated and empowered to the highest level. So obviously this is a really broad goal. There's a lot of components within that, but the idea behind a, bar, a board goal is that it is broad and it sets the big picture. And then our LCAPs will fall under that. So we could have a focus goal as well as a broad goal within our LCAP that addresses equity and access through high quality teaching and learning. The second goal is wellness and safety. So we wanna provide a healthy and positive school culture 
where both the social, emotional, and physical health needs of our students and staff are met to cultivate a positive environment which promotes high levels of connection, engagement, and overall well being throughout the school community. And during COVID 19, we've definitely taken this into consideration as we think about the health and wellness of our staff and our students and how we can help them. Um, be supported in education, no matter if it's a pandemic or not. Communication and connection, we wanna ensure an open communication process between the board and all stakeholders, while promoting high levels of connection between the board, community, stakeholders, and students. So we want it to be a two-way street. You're elected officials, you represent the community. Um, and so we wanna make sure that there is open communication between all of the stakeholders and the board. And then finally, financial stability. We want to ensure that the district is financially stable through responsible expenditures and increasing revenue through fundraising efforts to support the educational success of every student. So the difference between that one and what other what we've had in the past is that obviously we want to be financially stable. We want to make sure that we have the money to spend on the programs um, that we have. But we also recognize that there's an opportunity for us to increase our revenue through fundraising. And last year we started taking a deeper dive into that. We obviously, that kind of slowed down, if not came to a halt um, during COVID-19. Um, but it's something that I am looking into for us to get back into the game um, per se in terms of making sure that that is something that we really think about on a regular basis so that we can tap into um, high donors, tap into organizations and companies that are willing to support our community and provide us to fill the gap in areas that we're not getting with our current state funding model. So there are there, so any, there, are, there any, are there any questions regarding um, where we are right now? with these four goals? Um, I don't, not, not specifically, I guess it's just more of a framework with the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm just trying to, so if, if I remember correctly, um, the, the goal was to adopt these goals next month and then April we did um, work on drafting the LCAP. Um, so I guess what I would like to challenge the, us as the board to is trying to make sure that to get us to, I mean, obviously, because I think what I'm going to say is going to be what we need to get to, to define the LCAP goals is what methods and tools are we going to need to achieve these goals? So I guess that's where we get more into the LCAP level would be the really how we're going to do it. And then um, for me, being a data person, geek, I'd like for us to also think about how we're going to measure progress. And that way we can know whether we're successful or not. So, but I don't want to necessarily wait until March to start that conversation. So I don't know if there's a way for us to have a shared place on the cloud where we can start dumping our ideas as a board. Well, what we, what we can do a couple things. One is we can do a subcommittee which could consist of two of you um, that can start breaking down this work. And then that subcommittee and I can work together to make a presentation at the, bo at the March board meeting. Um, okay. We can't work collectively because we don't want to violate the Brown Act. Um, so we can't have all five of you working on a document that that's then's going to be acted on in, in March. So the other option would be for us to hold a special board meeting between now and our March board meeting or to have another one in March um, that could be just on this um, where the subcommittee could present, there could be dialogue about, yes, we feel good about this. Yes, we wanna go forward. No, we wanna make some changes. Um, so those are the recommendations that I have. We, I would say we start with a subcommittee, take two of you that wanna do this, wanna do extra work, I would say, um, and work with me in terms of drafting these and then make a presentation in March. And then we can talk about if we wanna have a second meeting in March again um, to go a little deeper. Okay, I'd be happy to be on that subcommittee. I would, I would be, I would be there as well. I wanted to say, um, can you go back on your last, on your first slide, Dr. Pittman? This one. Yes. So into, um, into piggyback with what Mr. Rudolph has said, you know these goals. You know, that word up there is board goals. These goals over here are going to represent us 
the board. Yes. And I feel as an individual that we really, really, I love the words, but we really need to look at these words that we're representing because these comes back and bite us. And the, this, these will be my judgment day. Did I, was I able to participate as a board member to fulfill these goals? Or what did I do as an individual to help these goals? You know, like the equity and access through high quality teaching learning. I feel like we should put that in a whip and then spider out these words. You know, equity driven, culturally relevant instruction. What exactly falls on those and how do we make those words in action? that making sure that our children are, be, are, are having those. You know, because words can be words, but if there's no action to it, then it's no use to me. Um, you know, I'm seeing, you know, like Mr. Rick was saying that he felt like these are the, the menu and the food that Bayshore has served right now are more healthier than, than before there. That's another way of pointing that out. What is it that we're making Bayshore providing healthy and positive and a positive school culture? You know, I feel like we should have underneath this, we should have examples of what we're doing already to make this happen. That's just, that's right. just my opinion. Right. And that's what part of the action plan will be. And we want to make sure that we're still thinking it's from a board perspective. So we're not going to get, I'm just, we're not going to get down to an action plan to where these out, because this is the work of the board. So we're not going to outline specific programs that are going to exist. For example, we're using a specific textbook in our, in our classrooms and teaching social studies. That's not going to come from here because that's not the role of the board. The board is to set, to set the big picture. But what you're gonna to say to us is that under equity and access through high quality in teaching and learning, we expect you to be using curriculum that represents the students in which we serve. So we wanna make sure that we see books in the classrooms that um, are, represent the kids we serve in character as well as in authors. We wanna make sure that when we talk about um, the civil war, or we talk about the gold rush, we look at it from the perspective of all of the populations and not just the story that has been told because we expect there to be culturally relevant instruction within our classrooms. We know that there was a large Chinese population that helped make the gold rush happen and we wanna make sure that we tell the story from their lens as well. Um, so those are pieces that we wanna think about when we go a little bit deeper into these broad goals. Um, again, we don't want to get down. We don't want to get down into the weeds because that's not the role of the board. But you want to say to us as a school and as a district, this is what our expectations are. So now you have to come back to us and show us how you're going to make it happen. And how, not only how are you going to make it happen, but bring back data to us to show us that it is happening. So, for example, with the books, you could ask us to come back and say, I want you to tell us. Show us an example of the books that you're using in classroom in our in the classrooms that represent our student population. Show us that you are actually instead of just saying, show us the books that you're using. What process did you use? And those are reports that we as a district can come back and communicate with you at a monthly board meeting. Yeah. And just and to reiterate, there you go, you nail it. So, um, as a board member, I am now going to ask that I feel that I need to see each of those goals, a, um, a, a report back, you know, from, you know, any of those goals the, for our, and, and I, I hate to do that. I hate to Michael manage anybody because I, that's not my job and I don't like that, so but I would like to see, I'm asking humbly that I would like to hear a good, you know, a report and especially from our staff to see what they feel about our goals, because it needs to be transparent to our staff too. What do you guys feel like it? Are the board asking for too much? We already have enough on our plate. Is, is this capable? Is this um, within their reach? You know what I'm saying? So I like the idea. So thank you for saying that. Um, I don't want to take all of the time. Thank you. Well, 
I would just real addition onto your uh, comment, Teresa. Um, maybe um, again, I want to not violate the Brown Act, but maybe what we could each board member do is could we each email you directly, Dr. Pittman, and say this is what we were thinking, and then the subcommittee can take that input from all the board members and um as long as you're not as long as you're not communicating directly with each other because we don't want it to be a serial meeting um or a spoke meeting um right and we can use information because because de decisions aren't being made and right so i can i can collect information like what i can do is i can put out a survey and ask you guys some questions um and then the subcommittee can can work from there but it needs to be you can't be you can't say okay i'm going to call teresa and this is what i'm going to present to her and get her input and then i'm going to call cecil and present this to him and get his input and then call joy because then that's a that's violating the brown act and we want to make sure that we do not do that right that's why i was just wondering if it'd be okay if we could just each email you directly and then you you can compile the, the master list and then the subcommittee can meet with you and then um work on putting together a presentation to bring back at the next board meeting. Um, I think that I just, I just want everybody to have every that's board that's member that's to be able to input. Yeah. Their th yeah. Yes. Okay. So then that will be one of the next steps before we, as a um, subcommittee meet. Yeah. Cause th to be honest, actually the other point I wanted to comment back to Teresa is um, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. And one of the things I want to make sure we're careful on is, you know, any goal that we set, we can be successful at. We don't want to self-sabotage us. And I think one of the key elements to make sure that's the case is figuring out, well, how are you going to measure that goal? Right. And based on that, how measured, then you can determine whether you're not going to be a, a successful or not. So I, I like what you, you said, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. So the next was the governance handbook. So the components of the, the governance handbook includes defining what an effective governance team is, which includes both the board as well as the superintendent, um, unity of purpose, our board goals will be in there, the responsibilities that we have as a governance team, as well as our board procedures, and then protocols to support the governance team, um, as well as what effective governance teams are. And each one of these components were drafted from the California School Boards Association, um, utilizing their documents to make sure we were in line with the overall California School Boards Association's vision on um, the purpose of a school board in California and the purpose of a governance team and how we can collectively, collectively work together. And so that you all have a copy and it's also linked on our agenda. Um, next was a board calendar, which a draft was posted on the agenda, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, so what it does is, is it goes from July, which is the start of the fiscal year, through June. And then there are items that come up in each one of these categories. So there are recognitions that we are going to take into consideration, um, things that we need to do to ensure that we have effective governance, things that we need to do with for setting direction for the district. So for example, doing our annual board study session in January, going over our board goals in January and February falls under the setting direction for the district. Um, student learning and achievement, finance, facilities and food services, policy reviews, judicial reviews, human resources, collective bargaining, community relations and advocacy. So I am going to stop sharing and I am going to share the draft of So for example, you can see in recognitions, we don't have any recognitions in July and August because predominantly we don't have school in session and we want to make sure that we recognize people and programs when school is in session. Um, so in September, we do Attendance Awareness Month and Attendance Matters. Um, going back to our monthly highlights, starting this next year, um, we're going to start highlighting grade levels each one of the months, as well as a possible program. So 
If we had already rolled this out, we are in February, we would have highlighted Bayshore TV today. And then we also would have highlighted what was going on in the fourth grade because we're in February. Um, each one of our, um, the heritage months are will be recognized on here. So Black History Month is in February. Filipino, German American, Italian, and Hispanic Heritage Month is September through October because it's the middle of a September to the middle of October. Um, so those are spread throughout the year as well. Native American Heritage Month is in November, um, as well as obviously because November 11th um, is Veterans Day, we recognize our veterans in November. So those are spread throughout the, the months as well. Um, and so then the rest of the year just outlines what are all the pieces that we need to address as we think about um, each month and those key areas. So for example, effective governance, in August, we would do an orientation for board candidates. This would only be in our even years because we only elect new candidates in during the even years. So <clears throat> this August, we wouldn't do an orientation for board candidates because we're not having an, an election in November. Um, but last August, we did hold that. Um, January is our annual board study session. And these are the things that we would be doing, which we have done this month. And we're going to continue to do for the next few months. Um, thinking about writing the LCAP, Budget is under here in terms of finance. There's also points in terms of student learning and achievement. When are we gonna determine our LCAP indicators? When am I gonna share the data with you? For example, um, our CASP data for test scores, I would communicate that with the board as well as to, the, to our community. Um, our enrollment, in January we approved the SARC. Um, in September, we present um, opening of school report as well as our CASP results. Um, we also do a public hearing and resolution and adoption of our sufficiency of instructional materials. So I'm not going over everything. I'm just sharing with you that this is a pretty detailed calendar and we haven't done this in the past. And so what this will help us do, it will help us be a better governance team because then we can hold each other accountable to what's gonna be expected on a monthly basis. And you will know going into each month what reports and what data we can collect so that we can communicate back to you based on our, our LCAP goals, based on our four um, board goals, and based on this calendar. So are there any questions on the board calendar? Would we I be able to get it. a little link? That's yeah, it's fantastic. Would we thank get, you, like, thank even you. Even if it's read only. Uh, I I put the PDF on. Um, I uploaded it to the agenda. Oh, fantastic! So you I should be able to it. access the PDF on the agenda. If you can't, um, please let me know, and I will make sure that I do add it so that the public have access to it, and then I'll email it to you guys as well. But you should be able to access it on the agenda. Uh, I just missed it. It's there. Okay. Yeah, it's there. Thank you. Next, I wanted to report on my attendance at the Access Superintendent Symposium. Um, it occurs the last week of January every year. Normally, it's out of town, um, either in Monterey or they've sometimes done it in Palm Springs because they want to make sure that they have access to all of the superintendents across the state of California. Um, this year, it was virtual. And um, the theme was creating a thoughtful future by taking action now. I was the co-chair with Dr. Shantara Moore, the superintendent for the South San Francisco Unified School District. Um, it was pretty exciting to see an all virtual conference and how the platform that was utilized so that we could actually have live uh, keynote speakers as well as uh, smaller breakout rooms where you could actually have a conversation with other superintendents and with the speakers. There was a pre-conference that occurred on Tuesday and Wednesday, which was how to, ooh, I have a typo, how to be an anti-racist. Sorry. Um, and so that was a day and a half. We had some speakers come in and work with us as superintendents. We did a book study um, on the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And then we worked through action plans that each district was where they were, whether they were at the beginning of this work or if they were farther in. Um, we had three keynote speakers, Heather McGee, who is a commentator econ and economist. And she's the author of the book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone. And 
how we can prosper together. It comes out this month. Um, it actually, I think comes out next Monday. Um, and she was phenomenal. She actually, um, has due to COVID, she has rented or purchased an RV and she is driving across the United States as an economist, interviewing people and um, having conversations with them. And that's what kind of led to her book of the sum of us, what racism costs everyone. Um, she's on YouTube, she's a phenomenal speaker. Um, when Starbucks had to close down for a few days, um, I shouldn't say had to close down, when they chose to close down for a few days to do some diversity work about racism and anti-racism, she was their keynote speaker. Um, Dr. Pedro Noguera, who's the press professor at the Graduate School of Education at UCLA, um, uh, did a keynote. And then Alex Sheen did a very inspirational keynote. He is the um, founder of an organization called Because I Said I Would.org. Um, and he started out with, he made us laugh because he said, what not to do, don't make a promise on Twitter. So he had pushed out on Twitter. He made these uh, business cards that on one side, all it says is because I said I would. And then on the other side, you write what your intention is. And because his, his thought process was you, you, your, your character is told by the words that you use and the action that come behind it. So if you say that you're going to do something, then you should do it. Um, and so he posted on Twitter that he, if you want some of these, he'll, he'll send them to you. And so like the first day he, you know, got a, like a request from five people and he's like, oh yeah, this is no big deal to within a week, he had 15,000 people asking for these cards across the, um, the world. Um, and then they would write what it, what their promise was um, on the back of their card. Um, so if you have an opportunity to check out his website, I would, he was extremely, extremely um, inspirational. And then we were also very fortunate to have a fireside chat with Governor Newsom. Um, Wes Smith, our AXA executive director, sat down with him. There were some pre-questions. It was about 30 minutes. I'm sure you then saw in the paper um, that night, if not the next morning, um, statements that he had made um, in that fireside chat. I do want to say um, we were very fortunate to have him. This is my eighth year as a superintendent, and this is the first conference where we have actually had the governor come to our conference. Um, so whether you agree with what they say or don't agree, um, we were very fortunate to have him come and speak with us and speak with us in a conversation and not, um, not giving a press conference that he does on a, on a normal situation. Um, so we were, we were pretty excited about the turnout. Um, normally, we get about 500 people come, five to 600 people come to the conference. Um, we were expecting about 300 because it was virtual, and we got just over 300. So we had a great turnout, and there was a lot of great stuff that we, we were able to learn and walk away with. So I'm excited to take what I learned um, to work with the staff on helping us continue the work that we're doing. Great. <clears throat> Um, next is our, my COVID-19 update. So since our last meeting, um, the CDPH put out a new reopening school guidance. Um, what they stated was that small group and targeted cohorts can be on campus receiving support in any of the tiers, whether it's purple, red, orange, or yellow. Um, and so that's what our kindergartners are in right now. They are one of those small group targeted cohorts um, that are on campus that we're supporting um, because it's a select group of students. It's not an entire grade level. Um, it's, not the, it's not the hybrid model that we are planning to transition to, um, but it's for smaller groups. So students that have IEPs that might need to come in and work in small groups can be on a campus. Um, that's what is considered small group targeted cohorts. Um, once you are in red, orange, and yellow, all grades can open K through 12. In the purple tier, which is what we currently are in, only grades K through six with an adjusted case rate at less than 25. Um, so I'm gonna, on the next slide, you'll see our current adjusted case rate is 15, uh, 15 point something. Um, last week it was 17. The week before that it was 25. And the week before that it was 31. So it's been continuing to drop. Um, so schools um, in counties that have an adjusted case rate of less than 25 can begin bringing kids back to campus, but only through grades K through six. So for example, 
we are a K-8 school, we would not be able to bring our seventh and eighth graders back on campus right now until we were in at least the red tier. Uh, we are now required to post our COVID-19 safety plan on the district website and submit it to the local health officer and the state's safe schools for all team. So our safety plan is already posted on our website. It's already been submitted and approved by our local health officer. I just now need to submit it to the state safe schools for all team. Um, they have a different template. So I have to convert what ours looks like into their template and then I'll be able to submit it. Um, and we now also have to provide reopening numbers every two weeks to the CDPH. So there's a website that I go and enter whether, so the last two times that I've entered it, um, this past Monday and two weeks ago Monday, I put that we're in distance learning, but that we have some small group targeted cohorts. Um, and they are collecting that data from every school in the state of California because they want to have in one place, any community member in the state it could go online and find out what's going on at, at the schools and what's going on across the state. Um, it has not been published yet. Um, we, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the timeline is since we've already entered twice. I had assumed it was already gonna be public, um, but it's not public yet. Any questions on that? No questions. Okay, so the next is around vaccinations. This is the huge conversation, right? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I can tell you what I know and what I don't know. So what I do know is that we have more people that need vaccines than the number of vaccines that we have available to us. That's kind of the bottom line. That is where we are right now. As we know, the state of California had um, put our population in different tiers. And so, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Zeus. <laughs> and so we, um, tier one was health workers and anybody living in, in a nursing home. Um, that was tier 1A. Tier 1B originally um, was 75 and older as well as essential workers, which included educators, um, food service providers, um, um, people who fell into those categories. Um, the way that it works is the state disseminates the vaccines to each county and then each county gets a different number of vaccines. They also, their population is also different within each county. Some counties have a high population of healthcare workers and nursing homes. Some have little to none. Some have a high number of residents that are 75 and older. Some have little to none. And so that's why every county is doing something different. That's also why the state is move, may be moving towards, that's what we've heard, um, and he said it in, in some of his press conferences, is moving to a stage where um, the state is going to decide how, um, how the vaccines will move out. Um, educators are still in 1B. Um, the San Mateo County Office of Education, as well as the 23 school districts within San Mateo County, meaning the superintendents, have been working together to have a plan so that when we get to the point where educators in San Mateo County are eligible to be vaccinated, we will be just be ready to go. Um, so every district, um, it's based on an equity plan in terms of the districts are going to be ranked um, by the number of uh, percentage of unduplicated students. And so those that have higher numbers of students that qualify for free and reduced lunch, those that have higher numbers of foster youth, English learners um, will be at the top of the list. It's also ranked by priorities. So those staff members that are working with students on a daily basis would get vaccinated prior to those that are working remotely at home. And so each district is expected to prioritize their staff because we all have staff at various levels. We have some staff members who are working with kids on a daily basis. We have some staff members that are coming to work but don't interact with students, they interact with other staff members. And we have some staff members that are working from home remotely. Um, and then what they would do is, is go through each of those 1A groups, those staff members that are working with students and go through every district. So that means that every district where they have staff members who are working with students um, would get vaccinated before any district where a staff member might be working from home. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, our hope is, you know, 
a month ago, I was told it could be next week. That obviously didn't happen. Um, so the plan <clears throat> is to have our lists of all of our staff members to the county by Friday. Um, so that should um, they call us and say, hey, we're ready to start uh, vaccinating educators in that work in San Mateo County, um, we will already be ready to go. And then they'll say, they will call me and they will say, um, Bayshore is going to do their vaccinations on this date. Your staff members need to go at the, to the, on this date to this location. Um, and the locations, I don't know where they will be. I just know there will be one in the north, one in the middle of the county, and one in the south. Um, so that is the information that I have for vaccinations right now. Obviously, it's changing on a daily basis with the more information that we get. Um, and I will, I'm sending an email out tonight um, with that information to the staff. Um, I'm also, I'm waiting for a document from um, Superintendent McGee, which I will include in the, um, in the email, which is why I haven't sent it out yet, but I will then forward that email to you as a board, just so that you're aware of the document as well. Now, is there any, is there any um, feedback or any concerns with the vaccinations from any of the staff members? They have not said anything to me. That doesn't mean that there may not be questions about the vaccinations. Right. Um, but they have not come to me personally. Um, they are more than welcome to, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I can only communicate the information that I see. Um, there is not currently a requirement for them to take the vaccine. Um, from what I've heard from our staff members, they want to take the vaccine. Um, but there is not a legal requirement that says they have to take it at this point. Um, but obviously, you know, the more people that we get vaccinated, the, the, the safer we're going to be. But I mean, it's new. So there's still questions out there that I can't answer. Right. Um, and then community testing, I'm excited to announce that we're now going to be hosting two community COVID free testings um, at the Bayshore site twice a month. This Saturday will be another um, curative one from 10 to four. Um, and then um, twice a month, we will have the county, it, one will be curative, the other one may be the other organization that they had, which is a nasal swab. I don't know the specifics yet, um, but I am excited that it's starting this month, they'll be on our site twice a month for the community. So we'll continue to push out that information. Um, please continue to push it out yourselves. Um, please continue to be tested yourselves um, because testing is information. And the more information we have, the better we can be. Um, so these are the these are the current numbers. So for San Mateo County, as I said, we're 15.4. Um, we are a 3.8 positivity rate, and our health equity is um, my eyes are really horrible 6.5 percent. Um, and so, in terms of the tiers, the health equity and the positivity rate puts us in red, but the adjusted case rate, because it's over seven, keeps us in purple. If these two numbers, the positivity rate and the health equity quartile stay where they are or go lower and the adjusted case rate drops below seven, then we will go into red. So obviously we want our numbers to go down. We've always wanted our numbers to go down. And following the four pillars as our Bayshore TV um, news anchors shared with us, um, following the four pillars will help us get to that point. Um, next is the Bayshore Community Farmers Market Garden. So I had received an email prior to winter break um, from San Mateo County, from after the same person who is my contact in terms of the COVID testing, um, Justin Watkins, about the, my thoughts on possibly having a farmer's market at, at Bayshore. And um, some, some Students at Berkeley were doing a study on areas that were considered in food deserts, which Bayshore is, and farmer's markets that were available to them. And my response was, I would love to have a farmer's market at the Bayshore School. What can we do? And so since then, uh, Mrs. Baker, myself, um, representation from Midway, as well as representation from the city of Daly City, um, have come together to talk about what are our next steps. So how can we make this happen? There's um, a grant available that's already been earmarked for this work from San Mateo County. 
um, to figure out a way to get a community garden as well as a farmer's market in the Bayshore community sometime within this calendar year. Um, obviously taking into consider COVID. So, you know, it would be great if we could have it this spring, but we wanna make sure that we're still being safe and following all the, the regulations. So the, the next step for us is finding a spot in the Bayshore community for a community garden. So there's three areas that they are looking at. So we're gonna schedule a time where we can walk the community and actually look at those three areas um, and then talk to the city about, is there a preference? Why would you want it in one place versus the other? And so the three places that they're um, considering are the Bayshore Heights Park, possibly in Midway as they're uh, redoing their development. Um, and then the park that's at the end of Otilia and Rio Verde. So I'd love it if it was at Otilia and Rio Verde because it's just down the street, it's on the flatlands, it's easy to access, um, but there may be other, other um, items that come into play. Um, we're still in conversation about what a farmer's market could look like. And then our next step is to also set up community meetings with representation because one of the things that the county and the city has said is that the city and the county um, will, will move quick, more quickly if it's representation from the community that says this is something that we want and it's not just one organization. And so we're gonna start holding community meetings which have representation from Bayshore, the school, the BGC, Midway, the Senior Center, and if you guys can give me any other ideas of any other organizations that exist within the Bayshore community, we want to invite them um, because we do want this to be a true Bayshore community um, event slash opportunity um, to have here for us. And then the other part that also exists is through the San Mateo County Office of Ed, their CTE coordinator is linking up with us for opportunities for our students and students in high school that live in the community um, to for our entrepreneurship. So they might help run the farmer's market. Um, they may oversee the community garden, but it's an opportunity for them to have some entrepreneurship opportunities um, and working with getting credit, taking classes. It could funnel into an elective class for us or some coursework that occurs at the high school. So there's lots of opportunities um, as we continue to move forward. Mrs. Baker, did I miss anything? Um, no, I just wanted to comment that when we were talking about bringing all these stakeholders together, um, you know, we already started doing that with the block party, with the, the BYO that doesn't have a name. <laughs> we started calling BYO, like we were, we're already doing it. And so in some ways, this is just a continue, it's a continuation of that, um, of those partnerships and just adding some other stakeholders in to make this all happen. Um, they're also working with um, Franklin in um, Jefferson. So like there, there's, we're probably gonna have this as part of an electives wheel for the middle schoolers and, um, and kind of partner with them, um, with the county to have there be some, um, some of this entrepreneurship work within a wheel for, um, for an elective. So, um, so she, they're really helping us with that too. So I think, you know, whereas prior to this, our electives have kind of been based on what our teachers are, have skill to do. Now it can start to come from what the kids need and what they want and what um, our community has to offer. So we're really excited about this work. Audra, do you have a copy? Uh, those um, ladies did a presentation there in the city council meeting one time. I think it was last year. The, um, did you have a copy of the... I have a copy of the study they did, which I can share. Yes, the I study. Have, yeah. I don't know if any of the board members will like to have a copy so yeah. they can see it. That would be great. But another uh, um, stakeholders will be the PTO. You know, the PTO can be part of that. Um, it. I honestly think Midway Park is the, it's good because it's big and it has, you know, uh, parking. Um, but one thing that we need to consider if this even happened, it's um, how much these, um, what are the pricing is going to be? Because yes. so sometimes farmer's market can be very, um, a little bit pricey and we should understand our 
community, you okay. know. One um, of the things that they actually take into consideration, which was in that, um, I think it was in the study, but they actually did some research as well, is connecting with farmers who take EBT. So our families who may have EBT cards could still utilize the farmer's market and the prices are priced slightly differently. Um, but yes, very much to your point, we do, we don't, we don't want to offer something that then prices everyone out from actually being able to access the, the quality food. You know, I, I assume that the mo majority of the, of that would be organics or, I, or we don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, just because I don't, I, I don't know how the farmer's markets are organized in that way. Sure. Uh, I would say in the community garden, it would be organic because we right. would not be using pesticides. Um, and that's something that we have control over. Um, but there are different layers of, of getting um, identified as organic. Um, and so I, I, can't, I can't answer that at this time. Um, next was, I just want to let you know that we received an, a, a certificate recognizing the Bayshore School for participating in the U.S. Census Bureau, helping them set up um, opportunities to communicate with our community, um, coming and doing a presentation at our board meeting. Um, and so I will scan a copy of the certificate um, and share it with you. And then the final um, report that I had was just upcoming dates. Friday, February 12th is the Lunar New Year. Um, reminder, next week, there is no school for the week. It is President's Week. The district office is closed on Monday and Friday, but there will be staff there from eight to five on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then our next board meeting is March 9th. And that's all that I have. Okay, that brings Thank us- Thank you, Dr. Pittman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, board reports. Uh, are there any board members that have anything to report? I have nothing to report at this time. Okay. I'll no, I don't either. Okay. Ms. Teresa, do you have anything you want to report? Nothing. I just okay. want to wish everybody, especially our staff, hardworking to continue to do the good work and all our little ones stay safe. Thank you, board members. Thank you, Dr. Pittman. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'll keep this short. I definitely want to give another big thank you to Mr. Dyson, director slash producer of that amazing video. And of course, all the talent that was involved, young and young at heart. <laughs> <laughs> And um, definitely also just want to, again, thank you all the teachers and staff. This has been a marathon um, and you guys are doing an amazing job. Just, I mean, yeah, what we were hoping would be just a short sprint has turned into a marathon, but I, I think we're hopefully going to see light here. I think it's an ultra summer. marathon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then lastly, but not least, I'd just like to throw out a quick board challenge that each one of us submit um, at least one, uh, like read, read the board goals and at least submit one, like how you would like to see, take your favorite goal and how you would like to see that goal implemented and how you would foresee it being measured um, and submit that to Dr. Pittman. So... Right. And, and, and I, I obviously um, just thinking logistics ahead of time, if someone, I, I, I spoke up early as being uh, wanting to be on the uh, subcommittee for this, but if someone else really has a passion, I don't want to exclude anyone. So I'm happy to discuss that. But if, if, if there's no complaints, I guess uh, Rick and I will schedule a time with Dr. Pittman. So I want to, I like to put things in my calendar because if, they, if they're not in the calendar, they don't exist. So if everyone within, say, the next two weeks, and I know next week's a holiday, so, but just think about it, get it in, and then that way um, Dr. Pittman and Rick and I can schedule a subcommittee meeting and have that data to review it prior to the March 9th board meeting, that would be fantastic. Great. 
And with that, um, if there's no other comments, this meeting is adjourned at 8.04. Thanks, everybody. Wow. Thank you. Nice seeing you all. Good to see everybody.